Well, hello everyone, and welcome to the Ranger Rob Country Living Podcast. And this is going to be, I think it's a very exciting night because, well, first of all, we we have the legendary Dale Wiley with us, but uh, we have a guest tonight that's going to put us to shame. And it's Amy from uh, Dragonfly Farms. How are you? Good. How about you, it's Dale? How are you doing? I'm doing well, Ranger Rob. How are you doing tonight? Well, I'm kind of trying to get used to all that glare coming off the top of your head, but hey, you're... <laughs> Well, you know, I could, I, I guess I should get the Ranger Rob hat and put it on because you changed that filthy one you had on and put a clean one on. So I guess I could <laughs> at least put one on for you. <laughs> <laughs> yep. So uh, before we get started, I need to remind everybody that the Ranger Rob Country Living podcast is on several platforms. We are uh, through, you can get us through your, uh, your Echo. We can get us through Spreaker, Spotify, iHeartRadio, and all kinds of stuff. If you've got a podcast player on your cell phone just go into the search type in ranger rob country living and the podcast will show up i it's on so many platforms uh i just know it just shows up on everybody's uh, uh podcast software so check us out and uh we have gosh we're in episode 33 now so there's quite a few episodes lots of great stories lots of great guests and of course we have a great guest today which is amy uh, we're excited to have you so i'm um, excited to be here I need to tell you a little bit of backstory about her that uh, from us is um, we went to the farmer's market um, last week to, to see, uh, uh, well, Dale was there and he's like, we wanted to see how Dale was going to do with his setup because we were doing some pre-recording of how, uh, uh, how he got ready for the um, farmer's market. And so it's like, all right, I'm going to show up. <laughs> so I bring my camera. <laughs> I didn't warn anybody. Showed up with the camera and was like, "Hi, I'm Ranger Rob." And turns out, pretty much everybody already knew who I was, so that was kind of fun. So I started to go around all the different booths, and I come down to the end there, and I see this gal at the end. She's kind of all smiley, and like, and she's got pink hair. And I'm going, "Well, this ought to be interesting." <laughs> so I go over there. It's like she's got this great booth with all these little goodies in her. But then she told me this magical thing I wanted. I I was really excited to hear that she sells raw milk. And she says she's got her own dairy cow on Crooked River Ranch. And yeah. uh, it's like, wow, soup. It's kind of like something I'd love to do. But Sherry says, we're not getting a cow. So it ain't going to happen. So anyway, Amy, um, so you're on Crooked River Ranch, right? We are. Yep. And how long have you been on a ranch? We have been here six months. Um, my in-laws came over about a year before us. Um, mm. We are a... Hi, Victoria. Uh, hi, Victoria. Go ahead. We are a um, multi-generational family. We're oh. doing a multi-generational kind of farmstead thing going on. Right on. But um, eight months. I keep saying six months, but August mm. will make a year that we've been here. So time flies. Time flies, yep. That's cool. So did you do, um, um, before I really get in depth, we're going to, I got a lot of questions for you. Um, before we get really get in depth, did you do um, dairy or, or cows before you got to the ranch? Not cows. We got meatloaf, our first cow, uh, the money maker, we call her, not really, the, the milk cow. We got her back in November, maybe early yeah. December. And before yeah. that, I've had goats, sheep. Where we lived before, we only had about three quarters of an acre. So out here on five acres, we are living the dream. So uh, I had cows, sheep, chickens before, but it was never yeah. enough room. That's kind of what brought us out here was the dream. Yeah. And and being able, now we have three cows, three, it's like Noah's Ark around here. Cows, horses, <laughs> no pigs. Yeah, so she came over to our place because, uh, uh, and Dale pops out and he's resetting his uh, software. Okay. Um, uh, when you came over, it's like uh, first thing we had to do is make you pet, <laughs> pet, pet our pigs. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. But uh, yeah, so that's the first thing when we come over to your place, if you got to go visit all the cows and say hello yeah. and stuff, yeah. that was kind of fun. Um, Dale locks up a lot, so he comes <laughs> in and out. No, I, I, I always, You're back. Yeah. I, I was trying to see how to get onto the chat. Oh, I see it now. There. So oh, push the wrong button. <laughs> yeah, just push the wrong button, see what happens. <laughs> That's what makes this show so fun. So uh, anyway, uh, uh, I, so I want to backtrack a little bit and say, uh, so before you came to Crooked River Ranch, you said you had some of these other critters. Yeah. So uh, 
is this something you grew up with or is this something you kind of learned into? Learned into. Um, I've, I was a tomboy growing up, always outside with the critter hiking, but we only had cats and dogs. My husband yeah. had 4-H pigs in high school, and he also worked on his buddy's cattle ranch. So he has a little bit more livestock background than I do, mm -hmm. but I always loved animals. And then as I got older, especially when we started having kids, all things homesteading, self-sufficiency, self-reliance just totally fascinated me. And so I started reading and learning and watching YouTube and other things. And then as our means have grown to be able to do and have more of the lifestyle, we've grown into it. Yeah. So I got to ask the big question. Yeah. Why? Why can't you just uh, buy TV dinners like everybody else? What's wrong with what you? happens? What happens when we can't go to the grocery store anymore? That'll be next you know? week. It'll never happen. I know. That'll, that'll Biden be will next take, week. The government will take care of us. <laughs> and that's why we do what we do right there. Yep. 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 So yep. Um, do you have other people kind of in your, in a younger generation, we'll say, as opposed to me and Dale, uh, like-minded like you? We are looking for friends. <laughs> 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 so when you first started kind of, looking into this stuff before you even came to Crooked River Ranch, did you find yourself uh, uh, people kind of looking at you like, uh, are you crazy? <laughs> Not so much. People are interested. I'm finding in more the end product of buying eggs, buying the vegetable starts like Dale's doing, buying the raw milk instead of, hey, I do that too. Which yeah. it, it takes both ends of the spectrum. You know, it, it takes consumer and producer to make the world go round. Yeah, so um, for I do, I guess I should. I gotta. So we talked a lot about the farmers market last week. So I want to kind of follow up a little bit on that. So both of you guys were at the farmers market. Uh, how did you find the process to be uh, uh, going into the farmers market? I, I understand it's not very expensive. Uh, did you guys have any trouble like getting set up? Everything kind of goes smoothly for you, both of you. You go first. Um, yeah. Okay, I. I I've done hundreds of farmers markets and everything else. Um, you know, and this one is, it's a take what we would call a tabletop market, which is a little bit different from your standard, you know, farmer's market where you got a nice 10 by 10. Um, and I, you know, my mindset's kind of with that 10 by 10 spacing for uh, farmers markets and trade shows and everything else like that. So it's really hard for old man like me to break out of that mindset, but uh, you know, having the tabletop there is fine set up, uh, and everything else that was not a problem if if you'd have been at the beaver and farmers market sometimes that market opened at eight o'clock in the morning and i had to get there by about six in order to set up and be able to unload otherwise i was going to carry stuff like two or three blocks and you know basically it was it was you know, it was it was a complex thing at times and everything so this one was you know easy easy to set up um you know, the business guy in me like to see things a little differently, maybe expand this thing out a little bit, look at, you know, venues and everything else like that. You know, and I think conceivably for a community of our size in Crooked River, that we should be able to easily see two to three times the vendors that we had there at that market, uh, particularly if we could bring the people in and you can start bringing in some outside, you know, people from close by locally. So um, all in all, um, 200 bucks, you know, I sold 200 bucks worth of plants. I would have liked to have done double that and everything, but that that's fine. You know, we'll start it off. Our weather's not been good to us. So, yeah. you know, I'm hoping for a bigger turnout, you know, and I'm going to kind of jump on some little marketing, independent marketing across our local social medias here and see if we can't pump this thing up a little bit. Yeah. I like that. How'd it go for you? How'd it go for you, uh, Amy? It went good. This was our second time doing the Crooked River Ranch Farmer's Market. Um, we, money wise, we sold about double that we did the first time, but the last, the, the first one that we did, the one previous to that just had was the day before Easter. And we had that massive snowstorm and I found we got a lot of traffic okay. from, from folks coming back up the hill from the Easter egg hunt and they didn't know okay. that was going on. So, so they would stop. Yeah. But I'm with you, Dale. I've done a ton of craft fairs on the, on the craft fair, not so much homestead spectrum on the craft fair. The crafty stuff like my earrings and such i've been in the craft fair circuit for 10 12 years and so this this is run a little bit different 
I've also had experience with farmers markets and in a previous farmers markets I've participated in, it gets very, I have experienced almost clicky, like we've done it this way. Why wouldn't we always do it? And not oh, so much way. Open, open mindedness to yeah. expanding marketing, bigger, you know, just kind of that, this is what we've always done. So why would we change it? So I'm, I'm happy with what's going on here on Crooked River, but with, like Dale, I, I do see the potential. Yeah. I, um, I think it's kind of sad, but first of all, all the vendors, if it's a cold day, you guys are all freezing to death. <laughs> <laughs> I'm always freezing. Oh, <laughs> I know, but it's like, uh, I know when you go to other kind of, us. Uh, um, farmers markets, at least everybody can kind of set up some heating and, uh, or put an overhead propane thing up or something like that. Cause they have a 10 by 10 space in there. It appears that you know, that wasn't the case. And it seemed like there's a lot of folks in there could have used a little extra heat because you're yeah. sitting there when you're not Go moving ahead. around, you get cold. And you know, so they, I, they had a, they had a heater going in the door there <clears throat> and everything. And I had another, I, you know, had one similar to that out in the pickup and everything else, but I, I can tolerate cold you know you don't do the kind of stuff i've done all my life and, and worry about being warm um most farmers markets are actually completely outside you find very few of them that are inside like that i mean the artisan and stuff is, is a little bit more um of an inside thing but um there again i think you know going to a little bit bigger spacing because even though the table was cheap we didn't have a whole lot of room and and they kind of stuck us right in, in a traffic zone which is okay and everything but um you know there again I, I like my taped outlines my 10 by 10 areas and 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 really kind of have to look at this thing we've been going to grandson's baseball games and absolutely freezing our asses off the last month and everything i'm going why are we even playing baseball here until <laughs> you know you would hope the first of may or something like that that's pretty much a standard you know start off so you can't let the the weather is what the weather is and everything and you just have to be adapted to it i've been in some rainstorms and some other stuff and in those farmers markets and it usually passes by and people are right back out there doing things but i think amy made a couple of good points you know they've got some minor signage there and everything and i did have one sign there that uh you know it said natives and flowers and vegetable starts i didn't have our name on it as far as i'm concerned if, if i can help other people make money that's a good thing too and everything but yeah we needed to snag some of those people to come in off of their um food vendors work really good at farmers markets at artisan yeah. fairs you know at beaverton market they had a company called fetzers these guys had some killer brats and everything and, and boy that was you know that brought the people in and looking at what we did there your food vendors did better and always will do better at these markets the salsa dude he did great he sold out the people with the cakes and everything else like that, they sold out. We sold a few plants. We had some flowers. If flowers don't have flowers on them, they don't sell. You know, there's got to be color and stuff like that. And so, you know, and that's a nice thing. Amy's stuff is really colorful and, you know, and, and really catches some eyes and, and everything else like that. And that's, always, you know, kind of the retail aspect of the thing. So outside of those minor details like that, it's still a good outreach. And, you know, you try to build off of that. But there definitely is some clickish, you know, stuck in the mud types of things there. And coming into the kind of world I think that we are, these small marketing venues are going to be increasingly important and in everything. Uh, so, yeah, we'll see what happens. Looks yeah. like John made it. Hi, John. I didn't say hi to hi, Jack. John. Hi, Jack. Um, so let me take my story a little farther with Amy when we got to this market. Um, we got to talking and she goes, oh, yeah, yeah I, I also sell raw milk here. And she didn't have it there. And I'm going, you're kidding me. Because I actually never met anybody. Now it could be, but I've never met anybody that actually sells whole milk. Actually, I've never really met anybody. Um, I've seen it before and all that stuff. But, and, and then the fact that it's on Crooked River Ranch. And so uh, um, we followed up a little bit. And about a day later, I was like, I think I'm going to contact Amy because I've got this tons of spinach. And by the way, and I called Dale too. He goes, I don't eat spinach. <laughs> anyway, I, have, I, don't, I, I, don't I, have, eat I still have bags left. I mean, I can sell a lot. I mean, just give away more. 
And so uh, I said, Amy, come over here. Please take some spinach. And then I sent him home with some uh, uh, butter crunch, too. And she says, well, I'll tell you what. We'll trade you uh, a, a thing of uh, raw milk. And it's like, perfect. That's exactly what I've been calling out for in the ranch is let's share our resources. Yeah. He's like, I don't really want your money. It's just like, you might have something I don't. And I just lost it. <laughs> Dale will be back. Okay. <laughs> anyway, so uh, I was really excited about that. So we got your, uh, um, so you came over and we uh, showed you the hydroponics and all that stuff. And uh, I'm going to ask you so many questions here about your dairy in a minute. But I just kind of get follow up this story a little bit. So, uh, uh, I gotta admit, I, it's like, it's been so long since I even, I don't know a lot about milk. So I was even getting raw milk. I'm going, is it going to have a funny taste? Is it going to be kind of weird or textury with stuff I'm not used to and all that stuff? So finally the next day, Sherry and I was like, all right, it's time. Uh, I got to bring Dale back on here. Yeah. And there's Dale. So then, uh, so then I, uh, got two glasses out, sat them on there. I go, Sherry, come here. This that's time to test the milk. So I shook it up like it's, and by the way, I did still some cream on it to put in my coffee, but yeah. you can't really tell the taste of the milk from that. But I did do that. Anyway, so I shook it up and I poured it into these two glasses and Sherry and I like toasted real quick and it's like, drank it and I'm going, oh my God. <laughs> oh nice. my gosh. It was like amazing. It's like milk. I have not had it for years. I think we may have gotten that kind of milk from Smith Brothers Farm when I lived in Washington, when they the milkman used to come to our house. That's it was delicious. And it was like so then we're kind of rationing this milk that you gave us. Well, for, there's like, more where it came from. Yeah. So I, I I actually made a chocolate cake so we just have a reason to drink more milk. Ah, <laughs> and, we, and we actually and we didn't even have milk at dinner we always have water but no no milk with dinner the other night because uh because we had that we were looking for every excuse we could use to use that milk it was delicious it's gone it's yeah. it's gone well, we'll and so uh, so uh so first of all when somebody gets milk from you let's say i, I and you sell it for like four dollars a four dollars half, for half, half, gallon? half gallon yeah so once you get and you want to get your jars back so do you want us to sanitize them through our uh, dishwasher or anything, or do we just rinse them out really good and then give them to you to sterile? Well, Sterilize. I'll tell you the secret. I'm a little bit OCD. So people will give me back their jars, you know, we'll swap when they come get milk and they'll yeah. say, I put it through the dishwasher, <coughs> which is great. I appreciate it. I will still wash it again myself. Every jar yeah, I, I get back I do before too. I put, I wash it myself. No matter if you tell me you put it through the dishwasher three times. Yeah. I just want to know how do we turn it? Like I rinsed it out really good and all that stuff. It's like, but does she want me to try to sanitize it or run it through there? It's like, or it's, it's nice and clean rinsed out, but yeah. do I give it to you that way? Or do you, um, so this is for your customers. <laughs> I'm just <laughs> informing them when you return the bottle to her, what, what we're supposed to do with just it. Just so. rinse it. Just rinse it. And now I'll tell you, the biggest thing I found isn't so much the, of course we wash them, we sanitize them. But right. the biggest thing is letting the jar air dry. Because if you yeah. don't, if it's a little bit wet, even damp, and you put that lid on, it'll sit for three days until you bring me back the jar. You take yeah. that lid off, it smells. I, so the biggest thing besides sanit sanitizing is air dry those jars. Gotcha. So, But I don't now... want my people to worry about that. I do that. That's, I guess <laughs> okay. for me, that's the biggest thing I make sure I, is that after washing their air dry. I, I hate to be that guy that says, Oh, the Scribners gave uh, uh, gave uh, us the jars back, and I've always got to grub them out. They don't rinse them right, or something. I don't want to be I, that guy. I always scrub them. I always rinse them. I always sanitize them. I'm you, sometimes even if my somebody else washes the jars, I don't know it's done right unless I do it. I agree. So yeah. I would do the same thing. I know Dale. I bet you Dale would do the same thing too. <laughs> I've seen. Well, this. I would. You know, and, and and I think the thing is, you, you know, you. When you made that chocolate cake, cake, did you use the whole milk to make it with, and everything? Because that my, my oh the cake? No, I actually yeah. made a, a depression cake that has no eggs, no milk in it. Oh, okay. That's, yeah, yeah, it's, that's my, be... it's, my, it's a, a recipe that was passed on to from my mother. So my which neighbors is on when I was Range Rob too, by the way. 
<laughs> my neighbors, when I was growing up, uh, you know, we're going, let's, let's take this thing back 50 years to when a family with 400 acres could, could raise a family of six people on 400 acres or less. And, and milk and cows was part of that thing. And, you know, they, they came in, they walked in the barn, they went into their stanks and you locked them in, their feed was there. And you went around and you had the milkers and you put them on and you put it in cans, you poured it in the cans. There was a cooler in there and everything else. And then, you know, right in there was a jug that always went to the house or something like that. So, you know, we were getting it from our neighbors, buying it like that. So I grew up on that stuff, uh, you know, with the cream on the top and everything like that. And then back in 2000, and 11, when I when I had hit my major illness issues and everything else, and was trying to recover from weighing 144 pounds. So if you look at me now, you can imagine how horrible that looked. And trying to put some calories on it and go milk uh, milk was was something that we uh, I used a lot of at reculturing the bacteria in the gut because they took my entire large intestine out and everything like that. So that was a that was a process that was a years long process. And that that goat's milk was a huge part of it. And so, um, you know, I think that just the health factor of this thing alone, you know, that people would just be amazed at. Yeah. Um, Jack was saying that they used to take a wooden rod out in the sun and okay. let them heat up for several hours before they refilled them. So uh, <laughs> that's, it's like that's, uh, that's homestead just, sterilization right there, man. <laughs> yeah. The temperatures on the inside of them bottles was so hot it'd kill anything, you know. <laughs> That's right. Um, so, uh, Amy, I want to uh, kind of uh, get the story about how we got to dairy. So you didn't have a cow before you went, got the Crooked River Ranch. You guys moved to Crooked River Ranch. Why did you decide to get a dairy cow? I mean, I can understand if you got a cow for um, for eating and, and for food and feeders and stuff like that. But what made you go into the dairy side of it? Well, that was an aside. That was kind of um, the plus side, the little extra on the side. Uh, meatloaf was bred when we bought her, and we were. And by the way, you can put a picture of meatloaf on here if you want. Before all we right. Forget. We do have a picture of meatloaf. Yes, we do. Uh, Let's see if we I can see if we can all remember how to here. do this. It's in a share. Whoop. Give us a second, guys, because this is kind of new for all of us. But you gotta have a picture of meat. There you go. It should show up on my screen here pretty soon. There she is, I think. All right. Work. All right. There she is. <laughs> yeah, there's meatloaf so right there. All right. So, so go ahead and tell us the story about meatloaf. She was going to have a baby. And we were looking, all of us here, we're looking forward to this baby for months and months. Mm -hmm. And um, it was, I believe, the end of March. We were actually, you know, whenever a, a livestock animal is having a baby, you check on them all the time. And you tell them, I'm going to go to the grocery store. Don't you have that baby while I'm gone? You know, <laughs> we, we had gone to the rodeo, the roundup or whatnot at the fairgrounds. And we weren't there very long. I checked on her before we left. Then my mother-in-law FaceTimed me and I answer it. And there's a little baby cow on my screen. So oh, she wow. had had the baby while we were gone. And we were only gone about two hours and we came home. It was dark when we got home. They checked on her while we were gone. She, long story short, the baby passed away. She didn't make it through the night. And we did everything we could. That baby was in the bathroom, in the heater, you know. And my daughter, all of my girls, they cried. It was very sad. So yeah. Meatloaf was going to be, you know, give us her baby. And then down the road, either her baby would end up in freezer camp. But Meatloaf lost her baby, and now you have a cow and milk and no baby. What are you going to do? Yeah. So, <laughs> Into the dairy business. <laughs> and here we are. So apparently, this wasn't planned. Huh? I'm going to take her picture down so we can see you better. Yeah. So, um, so, so, okay, so now you got this cow. You lost her baby. That happens, guys. That's homesteading. Um, it is. So. Did you like have to do a massive like research of like what's the process? <laughs> I can yes. just imagine. And when we were expecting baby, we thought, well, you know, we're going to be able to have some milk. We could milk her by hand and we could have a little bit, you know, on your cereal or your coffee and and baby cow can have the rest and we'll let her raise the calf. We'll have a little milk if we if we want to milk her. Gallon. But now we Gallon. Have this Yes. Gallons. And now meatloaf is not a full Jersey. She's a Jersey Angus cross. Okay. So we're getting that really good um, cream on the top, 
but I'm not getting seven gallons a day like you would with a straight jersey, which is good because I could not handle seven gallons a day. <laughs> My milk clientele well, has not grown that, that yeah, much that yet. Has. That half Jersey combination, I mean, Jersey has the highest butterfat content of most of the dairy cows and everything. And so a lot of times, you know, a, a milking herd of Holsteins or, or Guernseys or something like that, you look around out there, it, depending on the size of the herd, you're going to see a few Jerseys in there just so they can bump the butterfat content up, and, yeah. you know, and get that better price. And so, yeah, you could end up with a lot of milk. Yeah. yeah. On, so on, a half, okay. on a half gallon jar, you know. I have about this much cream yeah. on the top. Uh -huh. It's quite a lot. And, and how so you get this cow, did you, did you guys start off hand hand uh, milking at first? Yep, we started off hand milking at first. Um, we Jimmy rigged a, a squeeze chute in between the fence and the gate. So we'd pin her in there because she right. didn't like being milked at first, of course. Nobody's used to that at first. Yeah, yeah. And so we... We started out with the makeshift squeeze shape, uh, gate and milked her by hand. And that took a really long time. So just in a, it took a few days. My husband said, I'm ordering you a milking machine. <laughs> <laughs> and that was probably the best idea he ever had. So now that you get this milking machine and stuff, I do know that there's some pro this is all I know that, I mean, it's just one thing to get your milk. So, so I know you probably had to learn how to clean, clean the udders and everything uh, before you get started. Uh, you probably had to learn the process of checking uh, her, each uh, one of her uh, uh, teats, they call it, and um, yeah. to see if they have any uh, issues. And so there's a test to do. Are you guys doing that kind of stuff too? Did you have yes. to learn all this? Yeah, so, yeah. And we learned pretty quick. We were vaguely familiar. It wasn't like, completely shooting in the dark. We're a little bit familiar with it just okay. from over the years, learning things here and there, but to get serious about it, I mean, it, it was almost overnight that we got serious about, we're going to have this milk cow. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, so uh, then of course now every morning, even with a machine, you got the process of cleaning, cleaning the adders. And then the fact you got the tester and make sure she doesn't have any ailments. And then you're actually going through the process of milking, uh, from hand uh, hand to me mechanical, which is uh, still a process to that. And so do you have to go through the process of every day of once draining the milk out of there, sterilizing all the equipment again, the whole works. And uh, I, I, what, you know, how hard was it to learn that process? And do you have the process down where it's uh, easy to do? Cause you got to do this daily, right? Twice a day. Twice a day. Oh, twice a day. Wow. We're milking twice a day, about seven seven thirty in the morning and seven seven thirty at night. So wow. when when we're all done chatting here tonight, then I'll go milk the cow. That if you if crazy. you if you want to make sure that you can never that you stay home all the time, Rom, buy dairy cows. You know, <laughs> not not one, but buy several because it yeah. you know, at least okay. with my beef cows, I could leave the place for yeah maybe a day or something that they'd break a fence down or something like that. You know, if it's got four legs and it walks around, <laughs> it's a commitment. Yeah. yeah. So uh, cl uh, cleaning and all that stuff, you got a good process down for all that? And it, was yep. there some things you had to learn to make that easier? Um, I think the hardest thing for me to learn and remember was the milk machine. Which tubes go to where, when... And I have it down pretty good now. When we first got the milking machine, my husband was kind of in charge of it, but I watched him several times. And then, then I pretty much took over. I pretty much took over the cow and all those things that are involved. Hmm. So on, a, like on that milking, ma milking machine, Amy, um, you know, I know this was the big thing, you know, that prohibited a lot of people from, you know, actually keeping one or two cows um, because really it wasn't that uncommon a hundred years ago. Uh, you know, if you look at these towns, Redmond's no different. My town, Forest Grove, was originally plotted with a lot of, you know, one, two, three, five acre plots. And you, you grew, you had some chickens and you had, you know, cows and everything else on your hand melted. So, you know, as time went on, that became more of a time consuming thing. So I find it interesting. There's, you know, there's really some kind of an economy of scale there for you, you know, and something to go, you know, mechanized with that thing. Uh, that makes it a little more viable for you to do something like that. Cause that hand milking, that's, uh, <laughs> no. Yeah. It's, it's, uh, the hand milking is not only time consuming, but I also have carpal tunnel in both oh, my yeah. hands. Yeah. And Absolutely. so 
I mean, that cow's got a huge udder. It's not, it's not like milking a goat, you know, for 10 minutes no. and you got a little bit and that's it for the day. I mean, this cow, we get a gallon and a half consistently morning and night. So it's three gallons a day. Wow. And, and you don't want to be know, there all day doing it either. Right. Wow. Because, because then I have to go in and, you know, take care of kids, clean the milking machine and do yeah. everything else I do. So she homeschools too. <laughs> yes, we do. She's, right. she's like, uh, well, this, this ideal person I just want to talk to forever. That's, all this stuff. That's the way. So well, we got the cows going here and, and uh, now you got this process of getting what, three gallons of milk a day. Mm -hmm. And so I don't know how you uh, got any word out before, before like the market and stuff, but I did see a post just the other day that you're literally out of milk. You've actually <laughs> been selling all your milk. We are almost to the point of a waiting list, almost wow. to the point of a waiting list. That's, that's how many milk um, customers, clients that we have. And yeah, I posted the other day that the fridge was empty. We have one separate fridge for milk and eggs. And of course, right after it was empty, then I went out and milked the cow again. And now you have milk again, but right. we, ha I have two um, baby goats and they were on three bottles a day, then two bottles a day. So that was helping use up some milk. And my goats are weaned now and they were drinking the cow's milk and we did get a bottle baby calf and he's taking about a gallon and a half a day. So, and, and eventually, you know, he's not going to be a baby forever. So he will start to get weaned and then I'll have more milk to sell, but I sell at least a gallon a day. And so the way that it all works out, I I'm almost on a waiting list. You, wow. you know what that means though, Amy? I have to get another cow. There you go. <laughs> I got a refresh. I'm locked up. Um, um, so my next question is, is um, um, how long would this cow provide milk for you? There have been varying answers to that question in my research. So what we think is going to happen is probably about 10 months. Okay. And, and you continue to milk her. If I was to stop milking her, number one, she'd probably get terrible mastitis. <laughs> yeah. But if I milked her less frequently, you know, as I, she would produce less milk and then eventually stop. Okay. So the way to get her going again is to get her bread again. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So uh, is that something that you, so do you have a, uh, um, I, I just know pigs. I got a board. Do you have a, uh, Bull. Bull. No, Bull? we don't. No. You, when ah, so, you could AI so, it probably. So how are you gonna how are you gonna deal with the issue of getting her? Oh, you're gonna have her uh assimilated? Assimilated. We probably will go that way. Yeah. Yes. Nope, that's what okay. it's called. We're, we will probably go with artificial insemination. Uh nobody here on the farm wants a bull around. We just we don't. <laughs> you don't want bull. Yeah. <laughs> no, I've I've had my share of that. <laughs> yeah, interesting. So um so I, I I know we've talked. You've mentioned a few times that you're actually considering. Of course, that's you know that's a family decision too. But yeah. you're considering another uh, another one. And if yes. you did do that, what kind would you get? And and how old? And and what are you kind of looking for if you decide to get another dairy? You can try to find another uh, female that's already pregnant, or or what? We were just looking today. Um the men on the farm are not on board with another cow. They say you already have one. So when she stops milking, then stop selling milk. I enjoy this, you know, back to the yeah. cleaning and the routine of it all. It, it, I would almost say it keeps me feeling grounded. I love yeah. the routine of it. The, it's kind of a cornerstone to my day. Yeah. I love it. So um, when we were looking, we would like um, either a jersey, probably not a full jersey, maybe, but I think that'd be too much milk to deal with un unless, you know, business just blows up and, and I do get to that waiting list point, at least part jersey. And I've, I have two prospects in mind, but um, the husband hasn't uh, handed me the checkbook for another cow yet. So. <laughs> well, you know, I, it, it is, I mean, I, and that's a great, this brings me into great is when you're homesteading and we have a part, we have partners. I have Shuri, you met Shuri and you have your husband is anything we bring on board um, also has to be part of the team and you have to be in the same way. 
like for example, the uh, the pigs. Sherry was very hesitant about us getting pigs. Uh, she very much enjoys them, but she works nine to five because that's how we get our insurance. And uh, so, uh, pretty much, I'm doing the pig, pigs and stuff every day. Now, occasionally after work, she would go out with me, unless she's got some computer things to do or she does our accounting or and she takes care of her mom's estate and stuff like too so it's really something like okay we'll get it yeah okay rob just may have dumped so he didn't kick us offline i bet he'll be back yeah he'll be back he'll get it on there and everything else and so you know, until he gets back here, we'll just kind of run with this and see what happens. And I guess one of the things, you know, that, you know, you sell your milk for around $8 a gallon. People need to realize that's a bargain uh, for a good quality, something like that. And they need to stop uh, thinking that any of this stuff can be compared to store-bought types of milks and everything else because it's completely different. Um, so, you know, that takes a little bit of, of stuff for people to get used to, but there's definitely a niche out there and everything. And, you know, I find that with my plants, my greenhouse plants and everything, that I, this is probably the last year, I think, for, for us and the greenhouse plants, just because it is a lot of work. Um, you know, I mean, I'll be 65. I'm still perfectly capable of doing it. Doesn't mean I want to put out that kind of effort and everything else. And so I'll probably take all of this and a lot of other stuff uh, and combine it into some kind of an online tutorial for small scale homesteading and everything. And, you know, look for my income that way and everything as we uh, kind of move into those. Um, one of the things I wanted to ask you, I think, Amy, and everything was is that, um, you know, percentage wise, anecdotally or whatever, um, how many people in your age bracket uh, your sphere of reference and anything understand what you're doing and think that it's okay. Yep. We're back. Everything. <laughs> there you are. Because it is, you know, I've got my ideas about the public in general and numbers and everything else like that. So I just kind of like to hear your opinion as to what, you know, how many of those people, you know, in your peer group or, 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 you know, stuff like that are actually, uh, you know, looking at homesteading or even some level of self-sufficiency because, you know, quite frankly, shit's about to get real here pretty soon and people, yeah, you know, need to be prepared. Yeah. I think that this is very rare, what we're doing I here. I do too, yeah. And what Ranger Rob's doing, what you're doing. I think this is very rare. Yes, we do live in a rural community here on Crooked River Ranch. And even, even in this part of Oregon, um, it's slightly more common to be doing the things that we're doing as opposed to even in Southern Oregon where we came from, but this is very rare. And I would hope that um, people out there would be inspired either by Dale or Ranger Rob or us, or in some way to take some steps towards being more self-sufficient, whether that be, oh, I have a goat and, or I like goats and I could do goat milk instead, or I could grow my own sunflower sprouts to eat or, but to answer your question, I think this is very rare. <laughs> No, that, that, that seems reasonable and everything. I mean, I've got five kids. They're all in your age bracket. They're scattered between 39 and 35, 36 right now and everything. And, you know, they it varies with them and everything else like that. They kind of understand what I'm doing they, uh, a little bit and everything. But, uh, you know, overall, my general feeling the, about society in general is about 30 percent of the people really have a clue as to what's actually going on and, and some level of preparation for it and everything. And I, I, I think, you know, we're particularly going to talk about food uncertainties or shortages or whatever you want to talk about here pretty soon. And, you know, people need to understand that, uh, you know, a, a greenhouse full of vegetable starts and, you know, a cow to milk and everything else. I mean, that's a great start, but it certainly isn't going to, you know, take care of everything. And so you've got to be really well-rounded on all this stuff and try to put all this stuff together. And so I think that's why it's neat, you know, that we get to hear what you're doing. Uh, you know, we get to see what I'm doing because I'll tell you every mistake I made. You know, like I said, I, I, I've i been doing this a long time and I've made mistakes already this year. <laughs> you know, I will make some again. But, you know, I, I if things went bad, I, I can last a while. I know that. And that's just, you know, people need to start getting to that level. 
And that's, uh, that's one of the things I, uh, I'm, I'm getting excited about is trying to create this community that I like finding uh, Amy was like, okay, we just found dairy. Yeah. So now I was like, oh, is, is anybody in a ranch doing uh, um, cows for meat or feeders? Um, it's like, is a couple of people get some studs out there to kind of, oh, know, that, no, that, that absolutely. Yeah, it's all over there. I mean, there's there's pretty decent size, you know, cattle down there on quail down uh, as you're heading out of the ranch to the south. There's yeah. So it's like, all right. So once we have a relationship, uh, and we're having real fun with the internet today, <laughs> but um, uh, if we can, you know, start communicating with people that you could share beef with, and then share dairy with, and share eggs with, and share vegetables and all this stuff by you know and things get tough wow you know we're not going to starve we're going to have food for tummies and uh and and be able to help each other and then of course and then you need to go into the resources and services of who can do construction who can fix electrical who can do plumbing who can do uh, uh odds and ends welding things like that and trade for maybe food and or trade a skill for another skill i mean look at 4500 people on this ranch if you could somehow get us coordinated where we knew each other enough to be able to help one another, um, I just think that'd be a great community. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I, I you know? think it's starting. I mean, you know, people like the, the farmer's market is one small, you know, spoke in a microcosm of different things that are going on and creating community. Uh, and I think we've all seen the deterioration of community in general over the last couple of years and people's sure. inflexibility and not being nice to each other and caring about each other and everything like that. It, it's just, you know, it, my feeling right now, and, and we've talked about this, Rob and I have, and I'm sure Amy kind of as long as the same line. I knew we were getting to this point in our society. I, and I just didn't think it was going to come as fast as it is. I think it's coming a lot faster than what people say we are. The next 90 days are going to be extremely critical as to what happens with our food supplies and everything and obviously our diesel fuels just went up dramatically in the last couple of days cost of transportation is going to be elevated um i there's spot shortages of diesel in the east coast and that'll move out to the west uh there's just any number of things that are out here and you know they they said power shortages possibly i don't know if that'll happen in this area it's hard to say you know i thought about getting a bigger generator and having it wired in well i did to it and, and I won't be able to do it now, so I'll have to be adaptive with, with what I've got. But I think that really we're all kind of behind where we would like to be or thought we would be at this time. That's kind of my feeling and everything. And then now, you know, I'm not panicking or anything like that, but it's like, yeah, I this is actually going to happen. Stuff's going to get real, so people need to start getting prepared. And having community like that, uh, you know, it is important that you're able to draw off a community that is one of the biggest uh, tenants in uh, pre pre prairie, I guess. <laughs> Gotta watch what <laughs> word you say here sometimes. And everything yeah. is to have, to have some sense of community and everything. And, and I think that just simple activities like we're doing here on this podcast and the farmers markets and those, you're not going to build a community in a month. It's going to take you several years and everything else like that but at least you know you have a core group of people that are trying to do it and they're at least helping each other out and everything and moving it along like that um i see her comment on trade i i'm open for barter anytime on anything and um i got some stuff but that's the only way you can get rid of <laughs> and everything yeah. so yeah and rob knows what i'm talking about that uh basically community uh, knowing your neighbor, um, you know, I, I know my, and I could, you know, in this case here, my neighbor is, is Ranger Rob and that's Amy and everything else directly next to me, but there are people I could contact, you know, offline or something like that. I'm able to help them or they, they can, you know, provide a, a need for me or something like that. That's great. That's how we need to do it. Yeah. yeah it's like, uh, I'm not sure if it's just like, do we have to just keep waiting for things to get worse before we get people to start communicating and helping each other? And unfortunately, I think the answer is yes. Um, you know, some of us, like, we're kind of, guess what? I just want to be a model of kind of what I've had a theory of or 
a theme I'd like to see the Cougar River Ranch change into. Um, uh, but yeah, it's just, um, I, I almost fear like some of these people are just not going to start thinking about this stuff until, you know, diesel is either not even available or it's gotten up to six or seven bucks a gallon. And uh, pretty soon the prices at the stores go up. If it doesn't, by the way, great. I'm, I'm hoping yeah. that doesn't happen at all. But the likelihood of the report, because I think it's important that whether you're young or old, that you still watch the news, just limit yourself to it. So you understand what's coming and you know what to prepare for. Should you buy a little silver? Should you buy uh, things that are tradable, stuff like that? Or ignore it and just live your life and, 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 and not worry about it at all. You don't know that answer unless you kind of study the news a little bit and then, and then look at different parts of the news and not just get a one-sided version. That's the other problem. Yeah. Um, and so well, I, I, I yeah, think people ahead. have been, you know, thinking that that's what it is. It's like, I'm going to do something. I'm going to do something. It's not going to get this bad. I I've studied this whole thing an awful lot and I, I know what the levels are we're at and in out of three levels of preparing, um, I would say we're midway through the second level right now. Uh, and the only thing we need to complicate this is some, some grid issues with water and electricity. That completely changes the complexion of everything, um, both in distribution and everything that we would be looking at on goods, fuel, uh, services like that. When those chains are disrupted, it's an exponential free fall into anarchy, and you've got to be prepared for that. Yeah, I'd like even... to say... Uh... Go ahead. I need some new conspiracy theories because all of mine have come true. <laughs> oh yeah, no, I, I'm the same way. You know, it's yeah, no, I, I'm I'm right there with you. And the more outrageous, the better, because that's just that's proven that that that's what's going to happen. <laughs> yeah. All right, so this is like, um, I, I bet you, Dale, you probably see this too with like our kids. Uh, like, I have a daughter, very intelligent. Uh, well-educated degree, making good money on that stuff. And and she knows we're doing all this stuff. And and I kind of pushed a little bit saying, you know, I, you, you throw a little extra water. She's in Phoenix. And I still know that in the back of her mind, she's like, you're overreacting, Dad. You know, kind of like, and, and in a courteous way. It's, uh, no animosity at all when I'm saying this. She's young and, and and her husband's a very material kind of guy, likes a hot car and all that stuff. Nothing wrong with that. So that's that's normal life. Yeah. But uh, when you start saying that, you know, that hot car may not be so good anymore. You may find out your water's going to run out down there in Arizona. Pay attention to it. You know, if it doesn't happen, great. That's wonderful. And maybe, uh, you know, the video games aren't going to be the thing that entertains the kid anymore. Pretty soon you have to learn how to play with a Tonka truck, <laughs> you know. And uh, so, I, but I still get that look of that deer in the headlights like, yeah, right, Dad. <laughs> and so, oh, my, my kids think I'm crazy. <laughs> yeah, and, I, and I'm not mad about it. I understand no. it. It's like, it's their life. They're living a totally different generation than me. In fact, I never really had any hardship, even my age. I'm a baby boomer. What did I have for hardship? A couple of recessions. That's about it. Nothing like our grandparents. So it's even hard for me to use my imagination of what could happen. But I'll tell you one thing, this week, if you guys were watching the stocks at all, it's like every day it's going bang, bang, bang. It's not just a bang and an up, up, up. It's like bang, bang, bang. It's a little different this week. <laughs> it's a little scary. Well, so it could be the You know, beginning. it is, and I, I think I've mentioned this before, is that I, I am a late-in-life child of Depression-era parents. My parents were in their 40s. When I was born, I have heard some stories and committed them to memory about the depression and how things went. Um, we're not that far from this type of stuff. Um, and basically half our population right now, uh, and this would mostly be, you know, in Amy's age bracket in that particular group, have never really been through a bad recession because, I mean, you know, you, you turn it back 12 years or whatever it was, 2008 and everything, um, they really weren't in positions to understand that or be involved in it. And, you know, that was nasty, but this one is going to be worse. Yeah. yeah and you got to commend anybody that's her age and, and younger 
Oh, absolutely. We'll take this to heart and start saying, hey, maybe there's something here. And what I really appreciate is, and I do it too, even at my age, I want to talk to older people. I mean, I want to talk to someone that's in their 80s and 90s and say, please tell me what did you do back then? How did you handle it? And and uh, how did you eat? How did, you know, how did you pay for your mortgage? How did you survive? Did you lose your house? I want to know everything because there is similarities, whether it was the 30s or whether it's, you know, now. And uh, so, uh, yeah, I am. Um, I'm hoping that that's what we kind of do here. With that, you know, I mean, what and what they're going to tell you, Rob, uh, just multiply that like times 10,000 or something, because, I mean, that's that's what the exponential effect is going to be with population and everything else that we've got. So, I mean, you know, trying to have a frame of reference for what we're looking into. You know, I, I heard the story is the guys eating apple cores and everything. When a more affluent person threw that apple away, they would eat the apple core. They would come to my my father's parents' place, the back door, you know, beg for some watered down soup and things like that. You know, my dad grew up poor, and, you know, I kind of did too, and everything. And that that stuff stuck with you, you know. And to actually think we could be, you know, right on the brink of that kind of disruption in our, our societal mores and everything else, it's pretty scary. Yeah, something I thought mm-hmm. of as you were both talking was, you know, you you have the part of the population that thinks that we're overreacting, you know, why don't you just go to the grocery store and get your milk and your eggs? Why would you do all that? Uh, I had a phone conversation with a a friend this maybe last week. And she said, "Um, well, what are you doing this summer? What are your plans? You guys got any trips planned? And I, (laughs) I I have a huge garden to take care of and I milk a cow twice a day. And I have three, well, at the time I had three bottle babies. I'm like, I like being home and now I really have reason to stay home. So you have the people who just don't understand or think that you're overreacting, but there is a, and these are the other people I want to be friends with is the the small group of people who are interested, who see the wisdom in, in doing these things for self-sustaining, but they don't think that they can do it. And those are the people I'm really interested in is you can do this. Start small. You know, mm-hmm. you don't have to do it all. And, and just like Ranger Rob was saying, you meet people and and form a community. You do this part and I do this part. And then we help to take care of each other. Yeah. And, uh, and if we don't have to utilize that in the future, what harm did it do? You gained right. a couple of new friends. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And it's like here, it's like I'm growing a ton of food, just like uh, Dale is, way more food than I can handle. I'm already yep. got too much food. And it's like, but but we have animals, so we can sustain our animals with the extra food. But, uh, uh, and I'm just at the brink of, I mean, just barely, uh, just hitting where I'm going to really be kicking it out. Now we're going to store a lot of that stuff, and it's going to be more than we need. And I'm thinking, just like Dale and I have talked about this before, we're thinking about our kids. We're thinking about family and friends. We, And one of the realities, I, I don't know what I was watching, but I think it was um, uh, Appalachia uh, Homestead. Uh, she was mentioning is we are going to be feeding other people. Yeah, we, 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 we got to face it. I mean, they're just not going to be prepared or they didn't have the resources or they just didn't believe the story, you know, or whatever. We're going to end up helping people. And if we don't, they're going to come with guns, really. And there is... Really yeah, and there's complete basis for that. Uh, you know, back in 2013, one of my great ideas, again, yeah, I get these great ideas all the time. Some of them work, some of them don't. And this one was the, you know, I had our, our five-acre place over on in the valley. And I thought, well, I may as well grow a couple acres of produce and, and start a U-pick operation here. That was great. So got into it, prepared it all, got it growing. And really, you know, it's kind of like Amy says, I, it was, it was almost therapy for me. I was a couple of years out from my illness and everything. And and it was great. I was able to get out and do something. And, but what I found come harvest time was the people, the amount of people that wanted to come out and do you pick was about 20%, maybe if that of the total people that came out or would contact me, do you, is this stuff picked already? No, I don't do that. Oh, okay. Well, we, you know, we went. So I didn't have people going out picking this stuff, setting up boxes and everything else like this. And so 
people think they want to get a little closer to the earth and their food. But then you find out, boy, it's a lot of work. You know, I mean, we got to pack it down out of the okay. field, do this and that, everything along those lines. And so it, it's going to take a little bit for the general public to kind of switch over to the small farm homestead thinking idea. And it may take a little bit to link up because a lot of the homesteaders like us, we're going to have stuff. My family's getting it first, my close friends after that. And if we've got something left over, then we'll see. But, you know, the American public, their, their ways of procuring food and everything are going to be severely challenged here shortly. Yeah, I, uh, I got to tell you one thing is uh, at my age, I, I guess I'm still not that old, but I'm over, you know, over 60. And if it wasn't for the homestead, I cannot believe how much exercise I do every day because I have to. Yeah. And I'm thinking if I didn't have this homestead, what would I be doing, you know, so well, you probably well, you, it can't be healthy compared to some of these other guys around here on the ranch. It sees a couple of them, they pop in down there at one of the taverns or something for beers a couple times a day, and they're pretty <laughs> piled by the end of the day if they're in there two, three times, know. you know, and everything. I'm the same way with you. I mean, I've, I've, I've had my bout of health issues, I need to stay healthy, I need to stay in shape, and everything. And you know, and I get out here. And my property is sloped. Rob knows it. it. It's it's a climb for anything around here. Most of it, the farming portions are flat and everything. I get my exercise and everything else. I'm not going to sit around and drink and watch TV and everything else. My father-in-law, years ago, while my mother-in-law was giving him a hard time, he was 85, still going out to his fields every day, lily bowl fields down Smith River. And she goes, oh, you're just going to die out there in that field one day, you know, and he turns and he looks at me and he smiled, you know, and everything. And he says, yeah, that's kind of the plan, <laughs> you know. <laughs> me too. It's like if I died out in the middle of the yard, just throw me in the garbage bag. Yeah, if I, if you know, if, if, <laughs> that, if, that, can't, if that can't happen, me standing on the Deschutes River with a fly rod in my hand, it needs to happen in the garden back here. Just, you know, roll yep. me over and start going. <laughs> so we're getting towards the end here. It's like, uh, Amy, did you uh, have anything you'd like to kind of pass up, you know, as uh, advice or, or anything before the show's over? Um, no, I, I do want to say don't be afraid because you've never done it before. Yeah, if, if there's one, even yeah. a piece of homesteading, like starting a window garden with your own herbs, if there's even a piece that interests you, look into it. Find somebody who knows knows more than you do do not be afraid just because you don't know it doesn't mean you can't do it yeah and it's not all going to come at once it's going to be incremental but you got to start somewhere yeah definitely and it doesn't matter if you're in an apartment or, or whatever if you got a porch or something is like just start with something simple you know and, and you'll feel good about just you know five little lettuce plants you'll still feel great and then yeah. you two can salad, eat two salads thing. a week yeah. yeah, it's this, like it's just as exciting as what we're doing. Yeah. yeah, this life is extremely rewarding. This what we we're all doing here. It's extremely rewarding. Yeah, definitely. So it keeps you yeah. grounded, that's for sure. <laughs> that's for sure. You know, and, and, and my biggest goal is like when we eat dinner and going, I want to say more and more and more. We grew that. That's ours. That's our pig. That's our the more I can say our dinner is something we produced the better we feel. So uh, I'm starting that now, like salads, we were buying everything. Now we're, now we're doing the lettuce and now I've got radishes. So I'll be adding radishes. It'll be mine. And, and the carrots will be mine. And it just keeps adding up. So I would say, start with a bowl of salad and see what is in that salad that you could replace not going to the store for start with yeah. that. You know, so, um, That's great. and, uh, I'll, Dale, I got to make sure you get your two cents in or anything you wanted to throw in before we call it a day. No, I mean, just like that. It's, it's you start incrementally. You're not going to feed the world. That was my problem with my truck farm. I thought I had to feed the world. Uh, I was able to give a lot of it away to gleaners where it didn't sell. That was pretty satisfying uh, and everything. But, yeah, don't don't think that you have to get into this and, and produce 100% of your food. It's not going to happen yeah. that way. But it is going to help you develop some strategy for uh, being a little more secure in your food. Yeah. So sure. I got to wrap this up, but Amy, thank right. you so much for joining us. Uh, thank you for we're going to have you on some more. Uh, we, we didn't even scratch the surface and <laughs> Dale will be back. <laughs> All right. We had a little trouble with the internet tonight, but that happens. You guys just got to be patient. Live shows go that way. So uh, don't hang up. I mean, don't, 
leave the platform, but we're going to wrap okay. it up here. I want to thank everybody for watching, and uh, I assure you we're going to have Amy back on. So thanks, guys. Bye. Talk to you later. Bye. Thank you very much for watching our video. Please take the time to like, subscribe, and share our videos all over the whole wide world. Thanks.